cataractcoach.com. Podcast episode number 44 with Jeffrey Tabin, a true pioneer in treating global blindness. He's, of course, an amazing cataract surgeon, but also a world-class mountaineer. Our podcast today is sponsored by Harrow Incorporated. Welcome back to our Cataract Coach podcast, and today I'm excited to bring you Dr. Jeffrey Tabin. Now, Jeff gave a really fascinating talk in India recently, and I happened to be at the same meeting, and I was mesmerized. He's not just an ophthalmologist. We're ophthalmologists. That's actually easy compared to what he's done. He is a world-class rock climber, and his story and path in ophthalmology and his passions are really something else. You really were going to enjoy this podcast. You're going to learn so much. Jeff, thank you for doing this. I am sincerely appreciative. Well, I'm honored to be here, and it was awfully fun hanging out with you in India. Yeah, we had a great time. In fact, one of the things I like the most there is actually I learned extra surgical pearls in India about the MSICS procedure, which I think really in the U.S. we're not doing it enough. We're not teaching it enough. Um, I agree, although at Stanford, we're, our residents get a pretty good exposure, and we're teaching it. Yeah, I taught it too to my UCLA residents, you know, prior to me <laughs> retiring from that. But so take me through your path because you actually, your first passion was in ophthalmology. You stumbled on that. You're actually like a hardcore rock climber, literally world class. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I, I, I used to be pretty darn enthusiastic. I, I kind of pre tired a couple of times. Uh, be a long time till I retire, but I, I had the benefit of pre tiring a bit in my 20s. Um, yeah, I was a, um, a pretty keen climber when I was a kid, and uh, I was a ski racer and uh, hiked up a lot of mountains with my dad, uh, found a passion for rock climbing as a teenager, and okay. uh, got kind of lucky. I, I went to Yale as an undergraduate, and one of, uh, one of uh, my classmates was kind of one of the best climbers my age. And so we became partners in college, and he kind of really sort of pushed to elevate me. And then uh, I got sort of excited about a lot of things medical. Uh, I got excited about high altitude physiology. I got excited about uh, about sports medicine, and uh, decided I was going to go to medical school, thinking I would be a, an orthopedic surgeon and an expedition doctor. Was kind of, but, uh, but even, the, even you're, you're very modest. But this, you, well, you, you were the fourth person on the planet. Well, to, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that because uh, all these things are just serendipity. You know, none of it was really planned, and no, just a whole lot of luck and amazing, amazing mentors and friends. But what happened was, uh, I got uh, put up for the uh, Rhodes and Marshall Scholarship uh, right. uh, Committee by uh, Yale University. And I'd already applied and was accepted at medical school. And then, uh, lo and behold, I got uh, funded for two years to go to Oxford University. As a and Marshall that was scholar. really life-changing for me. I, you know, I was, I was probably would be a relatively content suburban sports medicine doctor now. Okay. Except that I had the scholarship to go to Oxford. I, I read, I was a philosophy major in college, and I read uh, philosophy at Oxford and earned a master's degree in philosophy. But it gave me the chance to sort of step back and think about what do I want to do in medicine? Why do I want to be a doctor? Right. Well, well, why, why am I going to medical school? And I looked at comparative medical systems. I looked at the moral imperative underpinning medical care and medical delivery and kind of compassion in medicine and began looking also at the disparity between the haves and the have-nots of the world and the difference between the quality and access to care in the poor countries versus wealthy countries. So by the time I matriculated at medical school, I already knew I wanted to do something in global medicine. But also, Oxford had this crazy system where you have an eight-week term, then a six-week break, then an eight-week term, then a six-week break, then an eight-week term, then a three-month long vacation. So I basically wow. had 28 weeks of paid climbing holiday wow. already based in England. And what was more, Uday, is they had these, these uh, indigenous trust funds that were remnants of the time when Oxford students were supposed to go out and explore the world 
And one of those was called the AC Irvine Grant for Oxford students to enjoy strenuous holiday in mountains abroad. That's and what it was I mean. memory. <laughs> <laughs> and it was given in memory of Andrew Irvine, who disappeared with Mallory on the north side of Everest in 1924. And it turned out that the more exotic of a locale you suggested, the more cash money they gave you. <laughs> so my partner and I began sort of thinking about, you know, where we would go. And, you know, we weren't really the best two 21-year-old climbers in the world at the time. But, you know, I, I, by the time I graduated from college, I was climbing at a fairly high standard of free rock climbing. I had climbed several routes on El Capitan and Yosemite. I climbed several kind of big mountain routes. And all of a sudden, getting funded to go to remote exotic big walls where no one had ever been. What a and it really dream. opened my mind to, to, in a lot of ways, also just kind of to the whole concept of adventure, where you're going into the unknown. My climbing up until that point, I mean, even going and, you know, mm -hmm. throwing myself on a 3,000 foot rock climb on El Capitan, I still kind of knew what I was getting into because there's a guidebook, there's a little how difficult the climb's going to be, where you're supposed to go. All of a sudden, I started going to these big walls where no one had ever been and figuring it out and really uh, adding this sort of element of unknown and could you even do it? And uh, we got my partner, I had a great climbing partner at Oxford, uh, Bob Shapiro. And we uh, got really lucky with the weather and lucky, <laughs> it was amazing adventures. And we ended up climbing a few things that had never been climbed. We ended up climbing a few things that some of the more famous best climbers in the world, circa you know the late 1970s, early 1980s, had tried and failed on, not because we were better climbers, but because we, you know, had better luck with the weather. And we ended up, uh, so I ended up getting um, starting at medical school. And again, you know, it's a whole lot of kind of crazy serendipity. So I started in uh, in medical school, and uh, and I got asked to be the one of the keynote speakers at the American Alpine Club's annual meeting, which is kind of like you know the AAO of of uh, of climbing. And so I was giving like you know one of the big invited lectures at the AAO, but uh, in climbing. And you're a young yeah, guy. Yeah, you know, very young, and uh, you know, I was uh, 23, and all of a sudden I found out that there was this American expedition that was sponsored by National Geographic and ABC Sports that was paying basically a year's tuition at, uh, at medical school to climb the last unclimbed face on Mount Everest. And a couple of the uh, sort of my climbing heroes heard me give my talk and I was really flattered. A couple of them said they wanted to come out and climb with me. And we, I'd gone, you know, I was at medical school at Harvard and sort of on the East Coast, we went to a place called the Shawangangs, which is kind of my, was my local climbing area in college. And, you know, you can appear to be a little bit better than you are going to your local area. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they invited me, said, would you be interested in going, uh, getting paid a year's tuition of Harvard Medical School to go with all of your heroes to climb the last unclimbed face on Mount Everest. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Of course. So I, I got so excited, but then it turned out that he had me as a first alternate. Okay. And, and so I, uh, I ended up uh, getting all kind of excited about it. And then I ended up... Uh, ended up getting uh, kind of asked to go. And I got so excited. And again, this is one of those sort of serendipities that you have and said, I get really excited to go to the last time climb face on Everest with my climbing heroes getting paid to go. And I put in a, an application for a leave of absence. And then a few uh, weeks later, I got a phone call from a guy who said, is this Jeff Tabin? And I said, yes. He said, you're an idiot. No, I said, excuse me. He said, what? He said, yeah, you're an absolute moron. I can't believe you even, you know, thought you could possibly get a leave of absence to go climbing again after you just spent two years mainly climbing. And uh, anyone with half the intelligence to get into Harvard Medical School should know 
that you're never going to get a leave of absence to go climbing, but if you apply to do research, you can get credit. And I oh. happen to be an ophthalmologist. His name's Mike Weedman. Some of you may know him. He's still going strong at 97. And wow. Mike Weedman, he's in Boston. And Mike Weedman said, you know, I'm uh, uh, looking at these review of the leave of absence. There's no way none, zero, less than that. You'd get a leave of absence to go climbing. But I'm interested in the effects of high altitude on the retinal vasculature. And in specific, can we look at high altitude retinal hemorrhaging as a prognosticator of high altitude cerebral edema? So let's you forget go. about your uh, your leave of absence and let's talk about our high altitude research. So uh, I ended up going to, uh, we did the last unclimbed face on Mount Everest. This was 1983. And actually our route has never been repeated. And there've wow. only been two ascents from the whole Eastern side of Everest. We're the only first ascent done with no native support whatsoever. And it was just an amazing trip for me, an amazing and so many fronts. And uh, my research consisted of taking a photograph of everybody's retina before the expedition, a photograph of everybody's retina during the expedition, and a photograph of everybody's retina after the expedition. So three sets of photos, three months credit at Harvard Medical School. I love and, it. Uh, we actually published it uh, in ophthalmology, and uh, I presented it at the AAO. And uh, as a result of the Everest climb, I ended up having so many amazing things come my way. Like and what? getting asked, oh, getting asked if I would be willing to go and guide people up the highest mountain in Antarctica. Okay. And, uh, you know, just all these incredible kind of trips. So I finished medical school. I did apply in orthopedics um, and matched and did a, an internship in general surgery and then one year of orthopedics. And I had so many incredible offers coming my way as an, as an and one of the very few MDs who had climbed Mount Everest and the high altitude physiology. Sure. And I pre-tired and I spent the next three years uh, uh, mainly just climbing, uh, really rock climbing around the world, doing big walls. I had a company called Jeffrey Tabin MD Mountain Dreams doing custom mountain mm -hmm. adventures. And I worked a little bit uh, to supplement as sort of a doc in the box. And I worked for a while at a refugee camp in uh, Goma, Zaire. It's now Congo. I worked uh, as a doctor at a hospital in Nepal. And it was while I was working, at, and along the way, I, you know, as you mentioned, I became the fourth person to climb to the highest point on all seven continents. And uh, had you know, really a, a pretty darn good run and a lot of luck with uh, good good karma with the weather and uh, um, and I was uh, trying to think about how to balance global medicine and you know I've really been now seeing firsthand those same disparities in access and care quality that I've been reading about at Oxford and uh, I was feeling like I wanted to do something with my medical degree. I had a couple of interesting close calls um, as a mountain guide. I had a night in Bolivia with a client who had paid me to take him up a mountain in Bolivia. And he kept up a good pace right to the summit. And then he collapsed on the summit. Oh, my. And then we ended up getting stuck in a storm. And I really thought he was going to die. And you're thinking about where did I make a mistake he you know he has you know cerebral edema and high altitude sickness and here i am supposedly a doctor and a high altitude specialist and he's paid me to take him up this mountain and then i had a couple of clients who paid me uh to take them up mountains i was traveling internationally with who i would say hold it this isn't the person i really want to be spending two weeks with Right. And maybe it would be better to be a doctor and, and say, hey, my buddy Uday, why don't we go on this climb and pay for it myself instead of and climb with the people I want to climb with. Right. And also, I, I really sort of felt like, you know, after three years of full-time climbing, that I did want to uh, 
do something in medicine. And I was working at uh, one of the Hill hospitals in Nepal and finding it a bit frustrating. A lot of the issues I was facing were really more public health problems than things an individual doctor could have much impact on. I would have children come in emaciated with diarrhea and I would rehydrate them, give them antibiotics, but they'd come back two weeks later just as sick. And I had people dying from things, simple infections that were so easy to treat in the West. And I began thinking what I really ought to do is public health I was in the process of applying to PhD programs in public health when I saw the miracle of cataract surgery. It and really is our, a miracle. And that's really unbelievable. Is. You know, at that time in Nepal, in the late 80s, no one was doing cataract surgery with lens implants. And it was just accepted. It's very, you know, accepting culture that you get old and your fate is first your hair grows white, then your eyes turn white, and then you die. Oh, and in my little catchment area, there were about 25, 30 people who were shriveled, looking much older than their actual age, waiting to die. And a Dutch team came in. It was led by a, a, another wonderful person or mentor named Jan Koch from uh, the Netherlands. And they came and did cataract surgery with lens implants. And it was the craziest thing. People blossomed back to life. Yeah. And they look 20 years younger, and all of a sudden, they're walking and living. And what's more, you know, in Nepal, the expression for a blind person is a mouth with no hands. And when you're in a subsistence agrarian economy, and you're blind, you're a mouth with no hands. And all of a sudden, now children would be taken out of school because they would have to care for their blind parent or their blind grandparent. Right, seeing eye kids. And uh, all of a sudden, people are able to go back to work in the fields, children are able to go back to school, and people are really back to life. And I went, wow. And I went to Catman too, and there was no place where people were doing modern cataract surgery with lens implants. Mm-hmm. And I said, wow, you know, this is amazing. This is a place I could make a difference. And I called my old mentor uh, from uh, Harvard, uh, Mike Weedman, and I told him, uh, you were right, because he had tried to encourage me to go into ophthalmology right out of medical school. And uh, he uh, said, well, you know, I just learned there's actually a residency position that's just opened out of the match. It was a person who had matched in ophthalmology, but during her internship year, had decided to stay with her uh, partner and not go. And um, I, he said, there's an open position at Brown University. And so it was really quite amazing because I just decided I wanted to go to ophthalmology in April. And in, and the July, door I, in July, I started my residency at uh, Brown University. And and forget so, ortho. Uh, you came to your so senses. No more. Forget ortho. ortho. And so I started over in ophthalmology. Uh-huh. And then, um, and that was... Uh, really fantastic. But then the next thing, you know, how do you go from, you know, I want to do something in Nepal mm-hmm. to actually doing something? And uh, that's, that's, sort of, that's the hard part. So tell us. And, and at that time, most of the programs were programs like Orbis, where, you know, the Western doctor would fly in, do surgery and leave. I looked into being kind of the Orbis fellow for a year. And I looked into, uh, various uh, various programs. And the one person at that time who was really advocating, you have to teach local people to do the work, was uh, kind of an uh, curmudgeonly uh, Australian ophthalmologist named Fred Hollis. Sure. And, well, and I, uh, I was, uh, my second year of residency, I was... Uh, uh, at the AAO in uh, San Francisco, and they were talking about uh, what to do about the overwhelming burden of cataract blindness worldwide. And uh, um, it, uh, you know, the sort of model at that time was doing high volume intracapsular surgery and giving people plus 10 glasses. Oh, and uh, the uh, um, they were talking about how do we manufacture plus 10 glasses 
-hmm. at a higher rate and lower the cost of the, the aphaca glasses and uh, how do we uh, you know how do we get more loops for doctors in the developing world so they can do their intracapsular surgery with loops and uh, I don't know if you remember the name Norval Christie. He was an amazing guy. Probably did more. Did you know Norval Christie? Who did? I don't recall the name. Yeah, you, you ought to look him up. He, he's an amazing guy. He was in uh, 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 Tuxilla, Pakistan. Okay. And he probably did more cataract surgery than anyone who ever lived and ever will live. Wow. He was doing about 50 or 60 intracaps a day in Pakistan. He's a beautiful, incredibly, wonderfully kind, saintly man with little twinkly eyes. And when I met him, absolutely white hair. And uh, he never trained as an ophthalmologist. He was a general doctor. He was a, a Christian missionary doctor in Pakistan. And he was at that time, you know, the late 80s, uh, kind of person they were holding up as the model of what should be done for global cataracts. And Fred Hollis was really saying, no, it shouldn't be a Western, you know, missionary doctor doing the work. It should be local He's people. The fish. He's and, the local fish. and, you know, in Nepal at that time, the number one cause of blindness was cataracts, but the number two cause of blindness was uncorrected aphakia. Mm -hmm. And the number three cause of blindness were people who were permanently blinded by bad intracapsular cataract surgery. Oh boy. And so you can address you know, one, two, and three. By, by <laughs> up your game. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, Fred Hollows, you know, at, at this meeting uh, where they were talking about it, it was uh, being led by Carol Kupfer, who would send the, uh, you know, the head of the National Eye Association, National Eye Institute. And uh, uh, Fred Hollows stood up and yelled, Shit! <laughs> Everyone just kind of stopped. And he goes, Carl, you wouldn't have that surgery. You wouldn't let your mother have that surgery. Why are you condemning people who are better than you to stumbling around half seeing? I don't want to deal with shits like you. Right, right. And he right. walked out. I went, Whoa, who was that? And I said, Oh, that was Fred Hollows. He's a crazy guy from Sydney, Australia. So I started communicating with him, and I ended up. Um, uh, and what I didn't know was that my partner, elder brother, and the real genius behind everything that I do, uh, Sandik Ruit, was just when I was just finishing my time in Nepal and seeing that there was nobody doing modern cataract surgery, Dr. Ruit was finishing the last of his fellowships in Australia and about to move back and start the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sanduk had uh, grown up in a small little hill village, uh, several days walk from the nearest road, no running water, no electricity, and no schools. And he was in a fairly bad uh, cooking fire when he was about eight and ended up, uh, his father took him to a monastery where the monks said some prayers and put some local bombs on the burns. And... Uh, the reincarnate Lama in the monastery said, this boy is exceptional, he needs to get an education. So his father walked him for over a week to get to Darjeeling, India. He spoke not a word of English, not a word of Hindi, and his father left him at an English medium Jesuit school. And he ended up uh, earning a full scholarship to uh, uh, King George Medical School in Lucknow and then going to the all in the Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi for his residency. And then he was back in Nepal. He did a survey of blindness in Nepal and then was actually noticed by the same Dutch doctor who I watched, uh, Dr. Jan Koch, who brought him to the Netherlands to retrain mm -hmm. and really become a master at microsurgery. And then Fred Hollows brought him to Australia for a final fellowship. And um, so, he was back in Nepal the same time I started my residency. He moved back to Kathmandu and became the first Nepali ophthalmologist putting in interocular lenses. Wow. So when I finished my residency, I actually went to Australia. I did a, a corneal fellowship and advanced anterior segment surgery at uh, University of Melbourne under Hugh Taylor. And Professor Taylor is sort of the at that time was the world's expert both on trachoma and onchocerciasis, but also just a great surgeon and a great man and a great mentor. And he sent me over to work with Dr. Ruit. 
and I went over uh, to work with Dr. Rui, and I was just totally blown away today. I mean, that not just his skills as a surgeon, but the system he had set up and the compassionate way he was sort of screening high volumes of patients and giving everybody the best possible care. And uh, you know, very similar to what they were at that time already doing at Aravind and mm -hmm. LV Prasad was just getting started. And I, I watched Dr. Rui and we went to an outreach cataract program up in the hills. And in three days, we did 224 cataract surgeries. With IOLs. Semi -impressive. With IOLs. Sounds semi-impressive. Two surgeons, 224 surgeries, three days. Pretty so good. you get the breakdown that Dr. Rui did 201 while I did 23. <laughs> so 90 cat split. And, and what, what was more is I slowed him down because I, out of my 23 cases, I probably had to call him to my table to help me 10 times. Because, I, you know, I, in America or Australia, I had not been operating on black cataract after black cataract right. after black cataract. You know, white and black cataracts was all we had. And in those days, you know, if you could count fingers, you know, at four feet, well, your your vision's okay. You know, why don't you maybe come back in a year when it's worse? Because we had so many people who were totally blind. Like LP cataracts. All LP. Yeah. All LP. And, you know, in hand motion. And so um, when I finished my fellowship, I, uh, I moved to Nepal to work with Dr. Rui. Wow. It's actually kind of actually kind of lucky that in in Nepal it's a very non-confrontational uh, culture, and they won't just say no. Like if you know, I say come up to you and I say, "Excuse me, uh, do you speak English?" You'd say yes, and I'd say, "Well, is the Swayambhunath Temple this way?" And even if it's two blocks to the other direction, they won't say no. You're wrong. It's that way. They just say yes. <laughs> so I. So I told Dr. Rui I wanted to come work with him. Oh, well, well, we'll see. You know, there may not be much funding for you, and I'm not sure, you know. Mm. And I go, well, that's okay. I'll, I'll try to arrange my funding. And anyways, I ended up uh, coming to Nepal, and it was the most amazing experience. Um, uh, he, uh, he sent me to... Uh, I worked with him in Kathmandu, sort of learning his techniques, his delivery system. And he's a wonderful utilization of human resources where everybody works up to the highest level they can. I mean, we didn't have, we had, you know, basic lay people putting in eye drops and moving patients. And everybody was really working up to their very highest level of skills. So doctors could really stretch their skills. And uh, then he... Uh, he sent me to a place called Bharatnagar, which is uh, uh, the second largest city, or was the second largest city in Nepal at the time, on the very far southeast uh, uh, border uh, with India. And there was, uh, at the time, just uh, you know, one ophthalmologist serving about four million people. Wow. And really a, a, a delightful man, very, very uh, nice person nice caring person but uh, um, he uh, um, he had done one year of training in eye ear nose and throat in india and then oh. became the only uh, doc ophthalmologist in this wide area and uh, you know i thought dr root was sending me down there because uh, there was so much need and um uh, uh, his actual name was a wonderful misnomer. His name was Dr. I.C. Biswas, but few of Dr. I.C.'s patients could. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he uh, 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 sent me there during the monsoon when it was extremely hot and a lot of insects. And um, he thought he would sort of, that I was an American kind of dilettante who's just there to climb. Sure. And... Uh, and I, I, I really sort of worked and tried to, you know, get Dr. Ruiz's system and talk Dr. Biswas microsurgery and interocular lenses. And um, Dr. Ruiz eventually, uh, he was going to do the first cataract outreach in Tibet. And he brought me with him to Tibet. And we began working in Tibet and then into Bhutan and um, 
eventually I came back to the States to um, the University of Vermont. I was living, actually I've never lived the way I lived in Nepal. You know, I had someone cooking for me, someone cleaning for me, but we didn't have a lot of money to buy new microscopes or, you know, to really equip new doctors that we trained. And, uh, um, and when we start working in Bhutan, uh, this is now in, uh, you know, 1999, the first thing the health minister of Bhutan asked me, so do you also teach doctors in America? And I had gone, you know, from right from my fellowship to Nepal. So Dr. Rui and I decided I should probably be looking to do something in academic medicine in the States. Also, I needed to kind of get out of debt. And I didn't, when I would write to, you know, Alcon or Allergan or one of the American drug companies for support, I they would say, what's he doing living in Baradnagar, Nepal? He must not have passed the boards. Maybe he's running from a felony charge. You know, what's the matter with him? Story. And so uh, I, I came back, and I was fortunate to get a job at the University of Vermont. And I went to the University of Vermont for 10 years. And then uh, uh, it was very fortunate that Randy Olson and Alan Crandall then brought me to the University of Utah. And about another started 10 years. The, and I stayed there for 10 years. We uh, started the first academic division of global ophthalmology. And now I've been uh, at Stanford for the last seven years. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, we had on the podcast one of your former fellows, Lloyd Williams, who obviously is oh, a great Oh, what a great guy. guy. Well, he loves I, I you. speak highly of him. He, he was fantastic. Although, and so now you've been at Stanford for the last seven, you said. Yeah, although, although Dr. Williams is a much better uh, ophthalmologist than he is a rock climber. <laughs> I took a lot of grief because I used to rock climb with him when he was uh, when he was at the University of Utah, and uh, shortly after going on a climb with me, where I kind of led him up a climb, and he said, "Well, gee, that was a great climb, Doctor Taven. Do you think I could have led that?" I said, "No," and then uh, three days later, he went back, tried to lead that rock climb, and broke his leg. And oh, he boy. Been on call, and it was a, <laughs> a big hassle. I got kind of a lot of grief for Dr. Williams breaking his leg, but he was a tremendous resident, a phenomenal yeah. surgeon, a phenomenal fellow. That's doing that. And he actually just, uh, I believe, he just got back from uh, doing over a thousand surgeries in South Sudan. Correct. Yeah. He was talking about that. Yeah. Amazing. So now the nice part is like you teach others that so you deliver an exponentially higher degree of care you can affect care on millions of patients now well that, that's what we're trying you know it's, it's all about education you know we started out teaching doctors in nepal to do better cataract surgery and then once we had some of our best young cataract surgeons so i was able through my connections with hugh taylor to uh, get some of our young superstars that we did uh, Govinda Padal do the first retina fellowship from Nepal, uh, Suman Thapa do a glaucoma and FACO fellowship, and uh, uh, Rita Garung did a cornea fellowship. So we, once we had all the subspecialties covered, we started a really a full world-class residency program at our how, place how, in Nepal. How big is the Himalayan cataract project now? How much have you grown? Uh, well, we've grown in location. And unfortunately, in Nepal now, they're all better surgeons than me. So I really don't have much to teach. I mean, you know, they, they, the DSAX, the DMAX, they do everything absolutely, you know, state of the art. Uh, Bhutan, they're doing great. Actually, Nepal's the only large, poor country that's been able to really reverse its rate of blindness. Wow. And uh, so when I came to the University of Utah in 2006, uh, we spread from just mountainous Asia to uh, Africa. Alan had already been working for about 10 years in uh, Ghana. Mm -hmm. So I began trying to use the same methodology to try and improve care, uh, first in Ghana, and then Ethiopia, Rwanda. My first African fellow was uh, from Rwanda. And... Uh, uh, we've, we're right now around a uh, $12 million a year program. And we are sort of focusing really on resident education, fellowship education, and developing sort of the paramedical personnel and infrastructure for uh, really high quality local eye care. 
wow, it just sounds like an amazing project. It started off with such a, a little thing, and it's grown to be so many countries. And gosh, well, we, when we started, you know, I thought that just getting a handle on the cataract situation in Nepal would be a lifetime. There were 250,000 estimated people blind, unable to do the task of daily living in Nepal from treatable cataracts, and another about 50,000 people going blind every year. So we mm. thought, and Nepali surgeons, and this included, you know, everyone, you know, Dr. Rui, but also all the intracapsular surgery was being done, were doing only about 10,000 surgeries a year. This was in 1994. And so... 10,000 surgeries a year. We're looking at a backlog of 250,000. Um, this will be a <laughs> lifetime. So, 50,000 new a year. Right. And people, you know, people die. Actually, one of the frustrating things to me is that a lot of the big funding agencies aren't really stepping up. You know, oh. it, it's the craziest thing. It is the lowest hanging fruit in global public health. You know, cataract blindness, it's one of the only things you can actually completely fix and restore somebody's life. And, uh, you know, the Gates Foundation says, well, we're only funding fatal diseases and we're looking at research and technology. But once you go but blind in a poor country, the life expectancy is one third that of age and health matched peers. So right. it really is a fatal blind, disease. You are going to die sooner, right? Yeah. Sooner and, fate, uh, you extend your life. Yeah, it sure does. Even in our world, it does but right. much, much more so in, in the poor countries. So when we, uh, you know, we, uh, we called it the Himalayan Cataract Project because we thought it would be more than an, enough work for our entire lives just to get a handle on cataracts in the Himalayas. And now we're really an overall eye care development program, really trying to uh, develop the training systems and local doctors and local economies to uh, overcome needless blindness. Addressing on, on one of these trips, is they, it, it, how many cataracts does one surgeon do in a day? Well, we have a wonderful, wonderful system. Uh, we have um, we have several surgeons. Actually, I've I've done over a hundred in a day on multiple occasions. Wow! Um, you know, and, and we have uh, working from two tables, um, and operate on this eye here and then by the time i finish the next patient is already set up. draped yeah. with a speculum in on the table right here you just try to the, the nurse hands me uh an alcohol so sponge i wipe my hands they've got a new instruments tray all set for me i just turn the stool and i start the surgery on the next patient and again by the time i finish this patient the next one's ready. Fantastic. Now you you must also be doing FACO for like let's say a younger person with like a four plus PSC cataract and not the, not much nuclear density. Yeah, we're starting. Just... No, no, we're we're starting to actually now. You know, it's kind of crazy. I, mean, I was with Dr. Rui in Nepal last year in a very very remote area, and we had uh, we had. Uh, our average patient was uh, 20, 30 pseudo phagic in the left eye, and they'd walk two days to come have their 20, 80 cataract done in the right eye. Oh, what happened to the um, black and white cataracts? What happened and, to the uh, you know, out of, uh, Well, they're, they're still, I mean, Dr. Lloyd Williams was dealing with them exclusively in South Sudan. You know, right. Africa, you know, Ethiopia still has about 600,000 people who are blind. But in Nepal, when we do, uh, when we do our high volume surgery, I always work with a phaco machine. And on this last trip a year ago, I would say I probably was doing probably 70% phaco. Wow. So what an incredible change you effected for that entire country well, in terms of blindness. Well, really, I mean, it was Dr. Rui and I was. Oh, the team. Of, you mean it's like been, the team. It's been an incredible team. But it's, it's been a really fun ride for me to be sort of part of that and part of that whole transition. It's just incredible. Yeah, it's, just, it's strange to me that you don't have some of these foundations funding it to bring well, it to it's every It's also strange to me, you know, frankly, to your audience. I mean, the joy that you have, you know, uh, it's uh, 
You know, I mean, you know, I'm here in Palo Alto. Most of my patients are really lovely, but, you know, I do have the patient who comes in and, you know, uh, there'll be a tiny subconj hemorrhage uh, adjacent to the wound. And, and they'll say, why is my eye red? Well, <laughs> there was a little broken blood. Well, why? I mean, you know, uh, you did Uday's cataract. He didn't have a little red spot in his eye. I've got a party this Saturday. How am I going to go with this red spot? Right. You know, right. and, and people who are, you know, going, uh, you know, from 2050 to 2025 and, uh, you know, they have a you know, half diopter of residual refractive error and, and they're just not happy. Whereas, you know, the, yeah, the, the I've been, joy, I've been yeah, the I've been joy, those trips. The, the joy and the love fest you yeah. have. I mean, you can imagine, especially it's sort of like it, everyone feeds off of themselves. You know, we'll do 200 cataracts in a day in Ethiopia. And first person I can see, the next one, wow. And it's just like spontaneous singing, dancing, and just the joy. It's really, really hard to describe. And why, uh, you know, more, right? Every stage in my career, I've always sort of, it's a choice between time and money. I've always opted for the time aspect. Oh, and, for sure. Uh, you know, I'm happy, happy driving my old Subaru, and uh, you know, happy having my Honda for 12 years. Of uh, course. And uh, uh, you know, why one more ophthalmologists aren't more excited about you know doing more outreach, but also well, uh, why you, why well, the big you... why the big funders don't? I mean, you know, th there's nothing even close in terms of cost effectiveness to giving screening children and giving them glasses right and curing people of cataracts and then you know prevent now there's a huge you know onset of diabetes around the world and you know uh you know preventing diabetic retinopathy those are the the three easiest things in global health no no and for so, sure and so why we don't have a uh you know a, a mark zuckerberg say hold it the Zuckerberg Chan initiative could actually overcome all needless blindness in the world for fourteen billion dollars. Wow! Yeah. I could be remembered as the person who overcame all needless blindness on Earth. Yeah, they you know, know. Well, what? Why? I mean, you know, why that that hasn't happened? Why we haven't been able to find someone? Um, one of your, your your Beverly Hills friends who uh <laughs> well, let me ask you so like I have done about a dozen of these international trips where we went to remote corners of the earth like Tonga or multiple countries in Africa or Vietnam or and I've had an amazing time and you're right it is absolutely life-changing to get some of the bilateral hand motion or life perception cataracts and then the next day they're normal but how does how do you recommend our listeners who are listening to the podcast, they're ophthalmologists, they want to do this. How do they get involved? Well, I think that there are several, you know, several different levels on how much time you want to spend. And uh, the easiest is to go with, there's some excellent organizations, you know, C International is superb. They kind of set everything up for you and arrange if you want to do, you know, one trip a year. Um, I think the first thing is to kind of think about where, where you want to go and sort of also think about your skill sets. You know, it's important to become a good uh, suturless extracapsular surgeon, places where you have these just so kind of how do you black cataracts. For, you you and, and I know how to do MSICS, but let's say your surgeon well, is only doing fake. We, we, do we, we teach a course at uh, ASCRS. We teach okay. a course at, um, at uh, the AAO. I actually just got a notification that our you know, the SICS course I'm lead instructor for was just uh, re-upped for uh, ASCRS in Boston. Uh, we have a wet lab. And the best is to go, I mean, to, you know, meet people who are really good sutural extracapsular surgeons who are now transitioning a bit to FACO. And right. we... There's, go and spend two weeks with them and they you can help you doing the SICS and you, you yeah. help them improve their FACO skills. Right. And, 
and you maybe, both win. And I, I think the best thing is to really develop a partnership with an individual doctor or an individual hospital. Think of where you want to live or where you want to go and go consistently to the same place and work with the same people and work to kind of help elevate their skills and maybe be the person that once, uh, you know, that things are really running well, you, you know, you can find a, a YAG laser to donate to them or you can bring them, you know, as your guest to the AAO or to ASCRS and really develop a partnership with an individual kind of, I was, unbelievably lucky in developing a partnership with my mentor Sandik Rui. But everywhere I work, I, you know, sort of develop, you know, partnerships with those local doctors. Um, to go as an instructor on an Orbis trip is a very good way to again make those initial okay. contacts. There's going to be the World Congress of Ophthalmology will be in um, Vancouver. Will be in uh, Vancouver this uh, coming August and Again, that's a, a really good place to meet doctors from other countries. Um, uh, the Himalayan Cataract Project, our website is www.cureblindness.org. And people are welcome to reach out to me. My uh, email is simple, just my last name, Tabin, at stanford.edu, or my first initial, G, Tabin, at cureblindness.org. And oh, uh, for the younger... For the younger physicians, I mean, a great thing now are the global fellowships. You know, we started the first global ophthalmology fellowship at the University of Utah now uh, 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, and now, now they're pretty more. Now your former now, fellow Lloyd is doing one at Duke. They've got one at Wills. You've got one, one at Wills, Stanford. University of Michigan, University of Illinois. Um, Fantastic. And so it's really kind of spread. and you know, It's in the San Francisco uh, match now. And uh, that's a great way not only to learn the skills, but also to develop those introductions and to meet, you know, young superstars like yourself in other countries. Well, that is just fantastic. It just sounds and like... I, and I'm sure there are, there are uh, lots of uh, doctors in Asia and Africa who are uh, uh, devotees of, uh, of your... Uh, of cataract coach. Of your website and go to cataract coach and there's so yeah. many people who would love to uh to link and have partnerships with uh, american ophthalmologists you know for sure well i even have on cataract coach one of the couple most popular things is i have a 25 part curriculum series of learning faco 40 minute videos 25 of them in a row a stepwise approach i even have a free pdf cataract surgery book how to learn faco yeah and it's just a file you can download it put on your phone email to and, your friends and with that said that the best little uh guidebook to learning suturous extra capsular cataract surgery is out of the aravind eye hospital in india now so if you oh, go to yeah. aravind.org and look for their they have a, a book that's easy to download it's free on uh, how to do uh, suturous extra capsular surgery and even msics has a role in my clinic in beverly hills in my surgery center first week in january I've got a patient booked already where we're going to a very dense, absolutely brunescent cataract, Coca-Cola colored cataract. Yeah. And a weak endothelium, uh, endothelium with a pachymetry of 610 and 880 cells per square millimeter on the endothelium. Yeah. You can't do FACO there. No, absolutely. And I, I, get, I get referred those from, you know, colleagues around uh, Northern California. And, and, and you, uh, you, just did, you did two today. I did. <laughs> I did. Um, but the uh, in Palo yeah, no, Alto, California, not not. I, not. But but, but, but I, I, you know, I'm not sure where this MSICS comes from. You know, the, the wound itself is a fairly big wound. It was actually first written about by uh, Michael Blumenthal from Israel, and he called it his mini nuke technique. And he used uh, an anterior chamber maintainer and a sheath slide and a bunch of other accoutrements, but he developed that self-sealing large tunnel wound of yeah. about six and a half to seven millimeters. And uh, he demonstrated that surgery in Nepal, and Sandik Rui was the one who kind of really took it to heart. Wow, this is the best thing for advanced cataracts. And then Sandik demonstrated at the All India uh, meeting, which was held that year in Delhi, and then a lot of Indian ophthalmologists sort of jumped on the bandwagon, and it's really, really expanded. 
but the right. uh, the name when we first published actually the first published report of it of high volume uh i called it sutureless extra capsular cataract surgery or secs which I kind of like is that sex and it's yeah. good to have lots and lots of sex. You know? and, and why MSIC has a manual small incision cataract surgery. It is manual, but it's not a small incision. Well, you it's know, a large what, incision. Well, the way I think of it, I call it in my mind, I call it manual MSICS, manual shelved incision cataract surgery. And okay, that, that'll work, but I like sex better. Okay. And you know what? I actually still will put at least one, maybe two 10 nylon sutures to close that scleral incision. Call me old fashioned. I don't do it totally sutureless. I like at least one 10 nylon in there. Well, you know, I, I find that, you know, with astigmatism, you know, we, you know, you, I, I like to look at the, you know, astigmatism and I operate on the steep axis. Sure. And I sort of That's a lot alter of alter my rune. Of, a little bit with a superior wound, I get about one and a half diopters of induced astigmatism with time. Right. And with a temporal wound, I get about 0.6. Okay. And I find that my my astigmatism, in my hands at least, is more predictable if I don't put in any sutures. And I yeah, just I, don't have it. I just don't have any wound leaks, and I always make sure that the conj, uh, you know, comes back and covers over the the external incision. For sure. But like to our young listeners out there, if you're going to learn this technique, you haven't done it before, I, you're doing it with your attending at a county hospital or VA hospital doing your residency, it's okay. I give you permission. It's okay to put a suture or two in. It's also okay to put a bigger incision. Rather right. than struggling to get a big black nucleus out of a seven millimeter scleral incision, it's go ahead up. and make it eight millimeters. Right. And go ahead and put a suture in it. No, absolutely. I think it's the be better part of judging with it. I even on Cataract Coach have a video for, for American students who want to learn it. I have one last cheat code, which is to make an uh, an opposite paracentesis, 180 degrees opposite the main incision. Mm -hmm. And then you can just put a spatula in there and push the nucleus out. <laughs> yep. No, there are a lot, lots of ways to do it. But no, it's it's a wonderful, safe, and also incredibly fast technique. You know, right. kind of the, the the best hands. You know, some of the best Indian and Nepali surgeons, uh, with the swinging table that I I discussed, um, are doing thirteen cases an hour. Well, oh, that's pretty. That's five minute cases. Wow, sub five minutes. That's yeah. I, we've seen a lot of their videos. We have them on Cataract Coach. Yeah, that's it's very impressive. But yeah, like I said, even if you're an American surgeon, don't be intimidated. You can take twenty or thirty minutes. I don't mind. But you gotta gotta learn the technique. You have to, especially if you want to do one of these trips that you were mentioning earlier. And then again, you know, the the whole thing is really in the partnerships. And there's so much good you can do. I mean, even and some of the older you know ophthalmologists as well, just to go and and teach. And uh, we have, uh, especially if you have any you know a subspecialty. I mean, there's a complete uh, lack of, you know, glaucoma specialists and not a complete lack, but there's huge insufficient number, usually sure. insufficient number of, of every subspecialty. So there's so much to teach and there's so much you can teach as a FACO surgeon and then go and really learn to uh, do a great uh, sutros extra capsular surgery. Fantastic. So to, to wrap this up here, what's next for Jeff Tabin? What you got next? The next 10-year plan. What you got? Well, the next 10-year plan is I'd like to see Sub-Saharan Africa move in that direction that Nepal and India and Bhutan are really doing so well. And I'm trying to figure out the economic, um, the economic incentives. And one of the things that's nice about the way cataract surgery is delivered in India is Indian ophthalmologists make a very good living for that country. The same thing with Nepal, whereas the remuneration is still a bit low and mostly it's in the government system in a lot of countries in Africa. So how to increase the incentives and increase the quality and delivery of care and more so even than in Asia, we have a clumping of the best ophthalmologists in the cities and very poor or non-existent care in the periphery. In the so I'd area. like to see yeah. how we're, you know, in Nepal, you actually make more money in some of our uh, remote hospitals that are away from Kathmandu. 
and there's a lot of incentive for really great, really great young, um, yeah, the, really great young, young ophthalmologists to um, from really great young ophthalmologists to go to the more peripheral areas. The other thing I'd love to do, honestly, is to find someone like a, uh, you know, a uh, Bill Gates or, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, sure. who, uh, you know, Sergey Brin, who realizes they could be the person who really transforms the world. They, hey, they so live it, in your neighborhood. It's, it's kind of, I mean, I'm in that neighborhood now. And it's, it's kind of a biblical quest, you know, cure blindness. Yeah, and here we are. Imagine. And so, so that, that would be my, my dream thing in the next five years would be to find and convince somebody that they could be the person. Because we have the whole roadmap. I've got the whole plan in my head, how we can do that completely. And well, all, one it, day, all it would take would be about fourteen billion dollars. But you know, one day one of these guys is gonna, one of these Silicon Valley billionaires is gonna come to you as a patient and be so blown away with the results of his or her cataract surgery that may, may very well happen. Well, anyway, so in the next five years, at the very least, I'd like to see a couple of African countries because it it's sort of like a domino effect, and you know, what's happening in you know, Hamel Nadu and uh, a lot of Southern India is now spreading North and, right. and India is starting to do better. And I, I mean, it's sort of the dominoes have fallen all across the country of Nepal. And I'd like to kind of get that effect going, um, in other going parts of the world. Uh, a couple of places in sub-Saharan Africa, but I mean, there's also still a lot of need in Laos and Cambodia and uh, places in Indonesia. So there's still an awful lot of blindness in our world. And so I won't be bored for the next five years, that's for sure. I have no doubt. Jeff, you're an incredible ophthalmologist, an incredible person. I really, truly enjoyed this interview. And again, I loved your lecture there. We'll put the links to your 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 website for cure, cureblindness.org. We'll put that in the podcast as well. And I encourage any ophthalmologist who's listening to this, if you have an interest, Jeff told you how to get involved. You can definitely do it. And hey, you may find him or me on one of those trips with you. <laughs> Thanks again, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Dave. It's been a real privilege for me, and I look forward to the next time I see you. Uh, probably in another country on the other side of the planet, but we'll have a good time nonetheless. Or in Palo Alto or LA. Sounds like a plan. All right, Jeff. Thank you and so for much. for sure in Boston. Okay. We'll Bye-bye. be there for sure. I trust that you enjoyed that podcast with me and learned a lot and even feel inspired to go out there and do your own global outreach where you can use your surgical skills to help countless patients in need. I want to remind you of a new podcast every single week. Please tell your friends about it and also check out our YouTube channel, cataractcoach.com, our website, and also follow me on social media. I'll catch up with you again next week.